There are certain moments in history that have compelled ordinary people to achieve extraordinary feats of valor. Moments in which legends are born. The history of the Eastern Cape is full of these moments. And the morning of the 6th of March 1896, off the coast of what is today Kenton on Sea, was one such moment. How's it? My name is Jakub Seidnot. As always, this is Stashy, and you're watching the historian stash. As a lighty, growing up in the Eastern Cape coastal village of Kenton-on-Sea, one of the first stories I ever heard was of the Volo shipwreck and the rescue of her crew. Now, Kenton is situated on a strip of coastline between Port Elizabeth, or Kabecha today, and East London, known as the Sunshine Coast. It lies on the eastern bank of the Bushman's River. Initially, Kenton, or South Gora, as it was known in the late 19th century, was a farm bordered by the Indian Ocean to the south, the Bushmans to the west, and the Kareja River to the east, with its northern boundary approximately 5 kilometers inland as the crow flies. In 1896, the farm was owned by an oom called Charles Butt. Yes, I know, it's quite an unfortunate surname. You must have been the butt of every joke. Oom Charles was born on the 8th of December 1834 and was educated in PE where he trained as a carpenter. He first set up a business in the Sundays River Valley, building wagons and coaches before moving to the settler hamlet of Salem. Here he established a blacksmith shop, kept sheep, ostriches and cattle and grew fruit and vegetables. It was also here where he met his future wife Tanya Hannah Francis Gravit. And that, kids, is how I met your mother. The Bats became highly valued citizens of Salem. According to the Grahamstown Journal of January 1870, Wim Charles was appointed as field cornet of the Lower Bushman's River Ward in the Division of Albany. He was by all accounts very diligent in carrying out his duties. After his appointment ended, he continued to trade as a general dealer in Salem and carried on keeping the peace in the district. The Bat children attended a so-called multiracial school in Salem. I say multiracial in quotation marks because a bench down the middle of the classroom still separated the white children from the black African children. Over holidays, the Bat family would trek down with Wim Charles' business partner, George Wood, and his family to the Bushman's River mouth. Then, during one such holiday in 1863, Wim Charles and George rode from the western bank of the Bushman's to the eastern side, where they found a cave. Both men carved their names into the sandstone wall of the cave. Their inscription can still be seen there to this day. The cave would later become known as Butt Cave. After discovering a freshwater well at a place we Kentonians today know as Dry Bones Valley, the two men decided that this piece of land, called South Gora, would be a great location to spend their retirement. In 1878, they took final transfer and ownership of the land. Once the back children were all grown up, Wim Charles sold his business in Salem, and he and Tani Hannah moved to South Gora Farm on a permanent basis. But 
like every retired person I know, Wim Charles couldn't just sit back and relax. He was constantly looking for things to do and he wasn't disappointed. Back in those days, due to the location of his land between two rivers, the only way to get there was either on horseback through dense bush or by boat. So he went about clearing a narrow road to South Gora. We'll follow that trail. What trail? The trail that we blaze. Wim Charles also built their stone farmhouse himself on top of a hill overlooking the Indian Ocean. He and his three sons, Charles Jr, William and Arthur, moved their stock, sheep and cattle from Salem. Soon the land on South Gora was being ploughed with tobacco, crops and vegetables being planted there. Wim Charles was still keen on his carpentry and left the farming to the sons. He also felt that now that he was retired, he could focus on what he called hobbies, like deep sea fishing and studying the fauna and flora of the area. Tani Hannah and the three daughters kept themselves busy with household chores and tending to the eye-catching garden. One day, Wim Charles bought himself a whale boat and fitted it with a sail. He recruited a crew of covered fishermen from the nearby Kipfontein community who he could take along on deep sea fishing sorties. He also built a ramp made from Kokopan rails at the beach known today as Middle Beach. From there he would launch his boat and from time to time Wim Charles would sail to Port Alfred where he would sell his catch as well as tobacco and vegetables. At the house he erected a large mast with a huge black canvas ball attached to it. Whenever he needed his crew, he would hoist the black canvas ball from the mast and they would spot it from across the Bushman's River, knowing that it's time for them to go to work for Wim Charles. This contraption also served as a warning to the fishing boats at sea that bad weather was on the way. Warning! 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 Ah! <laughs> Apart from the rudimentary early warning system, Wim Charles was constantly developing new ways of communicating with passing vessels and finding ways to make their passage safer. So he decided one day to embark on a solo mission to discover a reef that ran from Woody Cape right up to the Ponderland coast. This reef is mostly hidden below water, except at certain points during spring low tide. Therefore, it's potentially catastrophic to any vessel that's unaware of it. As a result of Wim Charles' discovery, the reef was officially surveyed and added to the mariner's charts. For his efforts, Wim Charles was apparently awarded a medal, and it's said that the land between the Bushmans and the Karicha rivers, bordering his farm, was exempted from government regulations and taxation. Well, no good deed goes unpunished. By 1896, Wim Charles was getting a long in the tooth and was quite happy living out the remainder of his days quietly with his family in this little paradise he had quite literally carved out for himself. But unknown to Wim Charles, he was on a collision course with destiny. Or maybe destiny was on a collision course with him because destiny was in the form of a 500 ton ship. 10,000 kilometers away, the Norwegian bark, the Volo, had left the port of Göteborg in Sweden. She was built in Arendelle, Norway, by shipbuilder and seafarer Knut Knutsen, and was captained by a man only known as Captain Olsen, whose chief mate was Knut's son. The Volo was laden with Baltic pine timber en route to Lorenzo Marx, or Maputo today, in Mozambique. By the time the Volo had crossed the southern tip of Africa, they had been at sea for four months and had not seen land since leaving the English Channel. On the 5th of March 1896, Captain Olsen made a dead reckoning that they were 320 kilometers south of land. But while he was confident that his vessel was too far from shore to be in any danger of going aground, he underestimated the ferocious early autumn storms 
that regularly pass by South Africa's southeastern coastline. Their experience working against him. If there's anything big enough to sink the ship, they're going to see in time to turn. The ship's too big with too small a rudder. It doesn't corner with a dam. Everything he knows is wrong. On the night of the 5th of March, the Volo ran into such a storm with a hell of an easterly wind which brought with it heavy fog and rough seas. The strong gale forced the helpless ship closer towards shore. Due to the poor visibility caused by the fog, the crew were unaware of how close they actually were to the coast. These were the days before GPS satellite navigation. All they had were maps, compasses, sextants and their own eyes. In the early morning hours of the 6th of March, a blood curdling cry came from the lookout in the crow's nest. Rocks on the port bow, hard as starboard. But there was no response from the crew. The lookout tried once more to warn the men below. On the starboard, starboard. But it was too late and the ship struck the rocks of the outer reef near the Bushman's River mouth. It was then forcefully carried over the reef by the swell and beached in the surf still a long way from shore. Meanwhile, Wim Charles had already spotted the Volo from his house. His grandson, Lawrence Lake, was 10 years old at the time and was with him when all of this was going down. Later in life, Lawrence wrote what turns out to be the only first-hand account available of what happened that fateful morning. He relates that he was having coffee on the stoop with his grandpa. Wim Charles would have the habit of sitting in his deck chair drinking his coffee while scanning the sea through a telescope. On that day, Wim Charles could see over the thick fog, suddenly, through his telescope, he saw the tops of three masts above the fog, very close to shore on the western side of the bushman's mouth. He stood up, placed his telescope against the wall, and told Lawrence to call his foreman, Class. When Class arrived, Wim Charles ordered him to waste the black canvas ball on the mast to call the rest of the crew from Kipfontein. Wim Charles expected his crew to think that he was mad for going to sea on such a stormy day. So he sent one of the colored ladies working at the house to personally summon them by rowing across the river in a ferry boat and running to Kipfontein. Wim Charles' men, now briefed of the situation, hurried down to the Bushman's River mouth to meet him. There they launched the tiny flat hulled ferry boat but it did not stand a chance in the rough seas and quickly overturned in the breakers. Wim Charles then moved down along the beach in a westerly direction for approximately a kilometer towards Kwai Uk. Here he found the Volo stranded with the sea breaking over the ship and the crew trapped in the rigging. He made several unsuccessful attempts to tie a line from the vessel to the shore. Apparently on the third attempt, after two hours in the freezing water, he swam almost right up to the ship and convinced the Volo crew to throw him a thin line to which a heavier strong rope was attached. Wim Charles then took this line back to shore. Now this would have been tough going for an oak in his 20s, but Wim Charles was 61 years old. Eventually the line was tied up on the beach allowing the crew to pull themselves along the rope towards shore. Lawrence recalls the rescue, writing, I shall always remember the sight of the first couple of men crossing the rope from the wreck to safety. They came over upside down and backwards, end over end ways. Then came the baskets, filled with sails, more people, food supplies, cargo. In the end, all 12 crewmen were rescued, even the ship's cat. You've got to be kidding me. Now the story goes that about at the same time from Charles' struggle in the surf, another rescue attempt was being made by an oak called Johannes Abram Karl Jan Skipper, a 30-year-old Alexandria farmer. Please don't ask me why he was called Karl Jan. I don't know the answer myself, but knowing the Eastern Cape and its penchant for crude nicknames, I think the answer might be too ghastly to contemplate. Anyways, 
Apparently, old Kalyan wanted to be the second Volrat Voltamada and rode into the sea on his horse in an attempt to bring the line ashore. I don't think Kalyan was quite aware of the fate of the first Volrat Voltamada, but be that as it may, he still tried to create his own legend. Now, to this day, there is still quite a lot of controversy as to who exactly brought the line ashore. You see, in South Africa, a bitter rivalry between the Afrikaners and the English has existed since the days of Slachter's Neck. It's some kind of blood feud, I guess, been going on for a long time. And at the mouth of the Bushman's River, you had two separate communities developing on either side. On the west bank lies the traditionally Africana holiday destination of Busman Sophir Mont. And on the east bank lies the traditionally English holiday village of Kenton on Sea. So you literally have an Afrikaans side and an English side. The tensions have simmered down a bit now, but 120 years ago, the Roynek rock spider quarrel was at its zenith. Now, as fate would have it, the Volo wrecked on the western side of the Bushman's mouth, which meant that this was on the Afrikaner side. So, the Afrikaners of Bushman Sophia Mont tend to place a bit more emphasis on the role that Carl Jan played in the rescue. Wim Charles was quoted in the Grahamstown Journal saying that he, Carl Jan, didn't know as much about the currents as I did and wisely gave up the attempt. But in Lawrence's own account, Carl Jan still played quite a significant part in the rescue, albeit in a supporting capacity. According to Lawrence, as Wim Charles swam back with a thin line, Carl Jan helped to pull the heavier rope out of the surf and together they secured the rope to a post, which was then tightened by a winch on the ship. Another version, told by Wim Charles's other grandson, Stanley Butt, a local maritime legend in his own right, goes that once the ferry boat capsized, Wim Charles continued to swim to the ship. There, he assembled a raft for the crew, after which he returned to shore on a bundle of timber with a rope from the ship. The crew then attached a thicker rope to the one Wim Charles had taken to shore. The thicker rope was then pulled in by Wim Charles and Carl Jan and attached to the bundle of timber before being buried by Carl Jan in the sand to act as an anchor. Either way, no matter which version you care to believe, the role of both Wim Charles and Carl Jan in the successful rescue of 12 souls and the feline can never be overstated. The bats took care of the motley crew of the Volo on the Kenton side of the Bushmen, providing them temporary shelter at Bat Cave. Some were also taken to Charles's house to recover. Later, the cargo of timber was offloaded at a low tide through a hole cut in the side of the Volo and stacked on the beach well above the high water mark. As for the crew, very little is known about their whereabouts after their recovery. It's believed that some of them remained in the area and actually took up farming. Captain Olsen himself did not immediately return home to Norway. I guess he was not too keen to explain to Knut and his investors how he managed to lose their ship and the cargo. Hey, he's not in the shore. Olsen eventually left, but it's thought that he probably spent the rest of his days in South Africa. For his efforts, Um Charles was awarded yet another medal, this time a silver medal and certificate by the Royal Humane Society in London for his bravery. In addition, the Norwegian government also sent him a medal, as well as a photograph of the Volo in full sail. Finally, he was rewarded with half of the ship's cargo. With this, and the stone from the original farmhouse, Wim Charles built a larger house with a spacious dining room where dances and other functions were held. He also built a shed, a dairy, a blacksmith shop and a horse and cart shed. Wim Charles also used some of the timber to build two cottages on the eastern bank of the Bushmans which he hired out to visitors. Local farmers also used pieces of the wreck 
to improve their seaside cottages in both Kenton and Busman Sophia Mont. The ship itself soon broke up and was sold off piece by piece. The remaining half of the cargo was auctioned off, loaded onto ox wagons and taken inland. One house in Grahamstown, today Makanda, was built using the timber from the Volo. This house later became the residence of the headmaster of Kingswood College. After that, it became Hobson House, one of the school's boarding houses. Remnants of the Volo can still be seen all over the area. The Volo's anchor can be found outside the Busman Mont Town Hall. Pieces of the wreck and anchor gears are periodically exposed along the beach towards Kwaiuk, and the ship's keel is submerged in the bushman's mouth. Sometimes when the water is clear and another great storm has caused the sand to shift, you can still see the long dark shadow of what was once the backbone of the Volo. But perhaps the most enduring legacy of the Volo is intertwined with the fate of the ship's cat. Once rescued, the cat immediately adapted to his new surroundings at the southern tip of Africa and thrived. In fact, he thrived so well here that it's said that his progeny still live on in the bush cat population of Kenton and Busman Sophie Mont. You are the love of my life. Ah, uh, sir, are you? And uh, you? And uh, uh, I am, I don't know you, but I like to. I gotta go. Now, like virtually in every story, there are also some aspects of this story that have been completely embellished over time. For example, it was always part of the Volo legend that the two Norfolk pines that stood on the hill where the Bad farmstead used to be had been sent to Um Charles by Captain Olsen or by a grateful Norwegian government. But the facts are that after the South African war ended in 1902, Um Charles took a trip up to Durban by ship. There he bought four small trees from an Indian trader and brought the trees back to the farm in his suitcase. To Tani Hanna's disgust, Um Charles planted two of the trees right in the middle of her precious flower beds. These trees can reach a height of up to 60 meters. As a result, the trees were visible for vessels out at sea and they have actually been marked on the mariner's charts as landmarks. Not much is known about what happened to Carl Jan after his heroic exploits. The historical record shows that he continued to farm in Alexandria and fathered at least eight children before passing away in 1938. As for Um Charles, he lived out the rest of his days with his beloved wife and children and grandchildren doing what he loved. Then on the 9th of July 1906, Charles Butt, an ordinary man who lived an extraordinary life of service, passed away quietly at the age of 71. His name may be inextricably linked to the incredible events which took place on the 6th of March 1896. But the truth is, Um Charles dedicated his whole life to helping others. He may have been the soft-spoken small-town hero nobody has heard of, but for those who have heard of him and have crossed paths with him, he made a monumental impact on their lives. It's for that reason that Charles Budd's story deserves to be told. That's it for now. Until next time, stay stashy.